Hello Megalithomaniacs and welcome to the first Megalithomania podcast. Today we're speaking with Robin Heath. He's a researcher based in West Wales and he's written a number of breakthrough books on the prehistoric science of Stonehenge and also he's done a lot of work on the bluestone sites of Wales where some of the stones from Stonehenge came from. Some of his books include Bluestone Magic, The Measure of Albion with John Michelle, Temple in the Hills, and Alexander Tom Cracking the Stone Age Code. One of the books he's written is called Proto Stonehenge in Wales, which came out a few years ago. And that looks at the landscape of West Wales and the Bluestone Quarry area and how that relates to Stonehenge. A new documentary has just come out on the BBC called Stonehenge, The Lost Circle Revealed. And in this interview, we have a look at that in quite close detail. And it features the work of archaeologist Mike Parker Pearson, who's also going to be speaking at this year's Megalithomania conference, which may be going online now because of COVID restrictions. We're going to make an announcement in the next couple of weeks. And he's done some astonishing research in the landscape there over the last decade, doing digs in various quarries and at various sites. And he believes he's found the origins of the blue stones and the fact that they may have even been part of a stone circle that was moved from the area to Stonehenge. So we're going to analyze the whole show, um, have a look at it in detail and also have a look at some of Robin's research and how really it backs this up and it kind of expands it to a whole other level. So let's dive in and welcome our first Megalithomania podcast guest, Robin Heath. So we have a special interview today with Robin Heath. He's joining us to discuss aspects of the new report that's come out, the new documentary that claims that there was an a, a original bluestone circle in Wales that got moved to Stonehenge. And this is all a big story at the moment. Mike Parker Pearson, the archeologist has been involved in this. But Robin's been living in West Wales for a very long time and looking and writing about Stonehenge in depth for an even longer time. So his analysis of what's been going on there over the last couple of decades has been stunning to say the least. So we're very pleased he's joining us to uh, have another look at these so-called new discoveries when actually some of the discoveries uh, have been known about for a very long time, obviously including the whole Merlin legend of him bringing the stones to Wales. So Robin, so just quickly, I mean, just so people, um, you know, I've done an intro already, but what is, the reason you're so obsessed and so into studying Stonehenge? Uh, obsessed is a very big word, isn't it? It takes many forms. Uh, I think what it is, is that I, from a child, was very, very impressed by the alleged age of the monuments that we're looking at, the megaliths, the prehistoric monuments. I lived in an area of Cheshire and Derbyshire in the Peak District where there were lots of these things, and my dad knew nothing of the, their age. He knew they were pre-Roman. And uh, something went off in my head. Hey, oh, dad doesn't know everything then. And I went to the local library and as an eight year old or a nine year old and asked the librarian, have you got any books on megalithic what, prehistoric monuments that were called? And the, he looked at me as though I was bonkers uh, and couldn't find anything. And uh, eventually I realized that all adults were a waste of time, uh, which they still probably are now. Um, <laughs> a waste of time because they couldn't give me any information. So I thought, well, someone's got to find out. Uh, one thing led to another, and eventually I went to university in Bangor, and, and simultaneously, for the same year as I went to university in North Wales, which is a beautiful part of Wales, um, a set of three books came out, which one was John Michel's Flying Source of Vision, followed by uh, Alexander Tom's Megalithic Sites in Britain, and then followed by John Michel's heretic, heret, heretical book, uh, uh, The View Over Atlantis. They all came out in the same period. And, and somewhere in that, I also got some other book, very good books. And what they did was they, as I was doing a science degree at the time, they, they made me look wider in the bound, than the boundaries of science, or as the, they perceived the boundaries could be in science, in terms of other phenomena that happened to do with these uh, old sites. Um, and that's where I started to suddenly realise that there was a big schism between the traditional archaeological route and 
a more, uh, uh, not, I don't want to use the term more scientific route, but a set of alternatives. And I've spent the rest of my time on and off, now full time, looking at these sites in a, in a way that includes things that archaeologists have consistently dismissed as unimportant or they've derided or they've ignored. And that's where I am today. And there's many books later, as you say. So with um, this new documentary that came out there, one of the things they did do in it, you mentioned archaeoastronomy, they kind of had a quick look at the archaeoastronomy, uh, which is often overlooked by archaeologists, has been for a long time. You've been at the cutting edge of that for a very long time. What do you make of the idea that they're actually now introducing that into archaeology as such? Well, I didn't think that they did reintroduce it, really. I mean, we've got Professor Ruggles, I think he's retired now, but Professor Clive Ruggles with a, a total station theodolite, which no one's going to know what that means, really. But it's, I'll tell you what it does mean. It means you get a hernia if you try moving it up a hill. Um, it's a theodor heavy, that one. And it's a precision instrument. And this is this was a very anomalous part of that bit of the move of the documentary, because Professor Ruggles has consistently written that the, there was no such thing as precision alignments uh, from the megalithic culture. And it, therefore, there's a complete anomaly between that statement, which he's written again and again, and the need for him to have the most precise type of theodolite, quite unsuited to do alignments with, it, by the way, but it's a, the most accurate theodolite around today. And lots of digital electronics and it does all sorts of things it plays tunes and it is a very effective instrument but you wouldn't use it to take it into a field study and use it for doing monumental uh, alignments for the setting sun the moon the extreme sets of the moon every 18.6 years um and so i didn't think that i thought after reading this comment so often from him it was a bit un uh, unusual that he was there for a few seconds trying to explain why it was impossible to measure precision alignments because the sun's moved from where it was 5,000 years ago. Well, the argument's spurious because, yes, the sun has moved, the sun's disk in width more to the south and north, depending on which way you're looking. But the thing is that in the megalithic people's day, they just built alignments and any silly person can go with a small standing stone in a field and put it exactly on alignment to where the sun sets now and in there now they set them exact they're not exact now because the sun doesn't set in quite the same place but this wasn't explained it was an ideal opportunity to get rid of this old chestnut that they couldn't possibly have had precision measurements you and i could go out with two poles in a field with a distant notch in a mountain and we by waiting for midsummer sunset, let's say it's midsummer sun, sunset, a bit early in the morning for sunrise at midsummer, we could go there, you and I, and we could set up two poles to be exactly on line with that at the moment the sun does its last flash before it disappears into that notch. And we could call that a precision alignment because it would be. It's no use coming along 5,000 years later and said they couldn't do precision alignments because you've got to do a little bit of mathematics to work out how much the sun's changed here's a program i wrote many years ago i brought it along to show people it's many lines long and it's complicated and that, that's what science does we, we invent aids to make complicated things that would be boring and to make it much faster so i enter the details and the time and it it automatically works out from a set formula that's scientifically like the like the washing powder it's scientifically proved to be effective and you work out where the sun and moon set, rises and sets. And this one prints out the, the first flat when it touches the horizon, when it's middle set, and, and when it's the f last flash of the sun or the moon when it, before it sets. So the other way around for, for rises, it comes the other way around. It's first flash, middle rise, and then disc on the horizon. Too much detail and specialised technical terms would, would, would make the film hard to absorb. And... Anyway, it would not be much relevance to most viewers. Most viewers want, they want a light touch, but they want to feel that something's been achieved. And the third thing that makes a good documentary is when there's acknowledgement of the historical context of the subject. 
And there was almost nothing of that in this film. And, and it invokes mystery. It invokes what is this great big thing doing in a field near Amesbury? Uh, and why is it the shape it is? Where did it come from? Who designed it? And we, and so that would, to me, have made that documentary a lot more interesting. We could have had a lot less of the always oh, mysterious and the woos and the was, which is a bit sort of a um, a big. Uh, it's a hard pill to swallow if you try and bring a scientific uh, re reason into these monuments, and they missed so much. They missed. They had an opportunity, and they missed so much to concentrate on this single belief or this single evidence that there were once, first of all, stones in the Aubrey Circle, the inner circle at Stonehenge, that when I started, you were not allowed to say there were stones in it. There were wooden posts, but no stones. And then a number of books came out that said, well, that's that's a red herring. The cremations were later and Bronze Age. And, and of course, the whole sub, the dating of Stonehenge has slipped back nearly a thousand years from the date when I started this work. So this makes, it makes you aiming at a moving target the whole time. So if we have this other circle, it, we were told it was 110 meters in diameter, and that's much bigger than the Aubrey circle, which is 83. But no mention was made of any numbers. The Aubrey circle is 56 holes, and 56 blue stones presumably went in those. What's the, what's the meaning behind 56? Who would choose 56? Now, if you any student of Greek will tell you that 56 is a number associated with eclipses and the god Python, Typhon, and and Monty Typhon, and um, it's a, it's a very big thing that the 56 is to do with the sun and the moon, and there it is. And why is it 56? There was no mention of the fact that that would have been a good prelude to this new circle. But we're not given the spacings of the stones in the new circle, whether they're equal spaced, as they are very closely in the Aubrey circle, or the holes that are left, the cavities, as Aubrey Burl call them. Aubrey, <laughs> John Aubrey call them, not Aubrey Burl. Um, and so this, these things add up. There's so much more going on in West Wales, and particularly around the area of Wine Moan which uh, this um, where the alleged circles being discovered and I, I i i i'm not an expert at below ground and we must remember that that and i'm going to quote mike parker pearson here in a guardian article last august on the 17th of august he said when we are looking at prehistory the buried remains are the only evidence we have well i can't agree with that because below ground is 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 really good you can if you find things that would have got destroyed or they're preserved in where they were and there's all sorts of interesting things and we love programs about that time team again and again and any program that's dealing with the the development of archaeology can make a very exciting program by discovering skeletons by discovering weapons by discovering the pottery or what they ate and when they ate it but that's not the, that's not where the end of evidence is now, what about the geometry? Stonehenge is a very geometric building. It's symmetrical, it's circular, and it's got numbers of stones which can be counted. It's got distances between everything, which is metrology. And we've also got to consider that right in the middle of all that, we've got the actual function of the device. What was it for? So we've got astronomy, geometry, and we've got metrology, the measurements. And all of that's above ground. And you see, I, I'm not a war with these archaeological people i rely on them for dating and all sorts of other stuff it's transformed my interpretation as, as new stuff comes out i get it and i read it and it's helped enormously but this is not the sum total below ground and if you want to know what's going on in a community in a culture you do not dig in the graveyard you go in the church in the church you're going to find out what people were thinking or you stand a chance. You do it by measurement, by symbols. The symbols in, if you go to, to Char Chartres Cathedral, you find huge amounts of symbolism that tell you what the culture, the vibrant culture that put that cathedral up and let it burn down again and again and again over many centuries. But they, each time, there, there was 
something there. Below ground was the most ancient and most sacred crypt in no Dolmen in, in northern France, a Celtic site of great value to the Romans. And not many people get to hear about that. On the tour, you hardly hear anything about it. So let's just say that if you ignore this other evidence, or you deride it, or you call people who study it lunatics, which has all happened, then you have to, at some stage, recognize that you're not going to get anywhere uh, unless this chasm between these two subjects is, is, is joined together and healed in some way. And the best way of doing that is for me not to slag off archaeologists, not at all. They have a valuable function, but that's not the only evidence. And I'm going after this other evidence, which has been ignored or put on the back shelf or quietly poo-pooed and never gets an airing on telly, which I think is unfair. Now, if we take the stone wine moan, which is that uh, is part of a very big geometrical setup in the Priscilla Hills, it's exactly south of the anomalous second mot at Nevin Castle which has recently been excavated, um, which I think is a very important geodetic spot, but it's exactly north-south of that. And exactly at the middle of that spot, of that line that connects them, are t is another uh, east-west alignment between Pentrevan, possibly the most well-known dolmen in Wales, and certainly the national symbol put on a lot of the tourist board posters, and we've got a Neolithic burial chamber on, on the top of, near the top of Carningley. And that forms a double diamond, a rhomboid of equilateral triangles. And it's very exact. And one feels it can't be an accident geometrically. It's, make, it's the construction of a vesica piscis, which is a very old symbol. So we've got the geometry there. We've got the geodetics of it. And Wine Mound is right on the southern edge of that, right down at the bottom. And then you look at the metrology of it and you discover it's in each of those arms of the equilateral triangle average out at 11,759 feet, English feet. We don't use metric because it would be silly to use metric for a, a something that's Neolithic. Metric's a sort of Napoleonic attempt at world domination through rulers. And uh, <laughs> so I don't use meters, but, but feet, the English foot, is what most people used and as i came into this subject with fluent in both systems i decided to keep using the feet and the inches but there are other measures and the russian foot which is found at a lot of megalithic site nothing to do with russia but it was first identified there the russian foot is seven over six of the english feet and if you translate that to uh, eleven thousand five seven hundred and fifty nine feet then something miraculous happens. You find that the diameter of, of, of the circle that you can draw in the middle of those two triangles has a diameter, or that 11,759 11, feet in Russian feet is 10,080 Russian feet. And 10,080 is Plato's number for the diameter of a cathedral. We find the same number in feet, English feet this time, at Stonehenge. The mid middle of the Sarsen circle is 108 feet. So numerically, it's the same number. And we find it all over the place in Temple. I can even find it at Avery. So if that's the case, and here's another one. Look, we've got the time. We've got all night, haven't we, really? We've got the time. If we go to Avebury, I mean, everyone goes to Avebury and they find, they, they report how wonderful they feel walking around the landscape at Avebury. All right. Well, I have been to Chartres Cathedral many times when I lived in France, and they tell me the same thing. They come out of that saying, oh, I feel straightened out after being in there. It's sort of done something to me. And you go to Avery and everybody says the same thing. Then it's not hippy-dippy to say that. I, I know people who are doctors and people who are crack scientists who go to Avery and they've been on tours with me, and they say the same things as the people that go there with, with peculiar notions and dream catchers and, and all the other wonderful, colourful things that go on around there. So here we are with a set of conditions where suddenly at Stonehenge and at Avebury, we've got everybody thinking that the area around Stonehenge, the, uh, around Avebury, the landscape, is somehow special. Now, what is it that makes it special? Is it a temple? So you 
look at Avery and you've got Silbury Hill here on the on the west side of Avery and just to the southwest of it. And you've got another mound, Marlborough Mound, on, on well to the east of Avebury. If you join a line between the top of Silbury Hill and the top of Marlborough Mound, you get 27 uh, 27,435 English feet. Google Earth, fantastic. You can do that yourself. You can do this at home. Please do this at home. Measure the distance between Silbury Hill Peak and the top of Marlborough Mound near Marlborough College. And then convert it into the megalithic yard of Alexander Tom that he found the value of at Avebury, just up the road, and it's 10,000 and 80, the, de the diameter of a temple. Draw a circle, it goes right through the centre of Avebury and it goes up to the top of the map in the north and there's Top Temple. So then that's the Avebury landscape, basically. So th there are th there's information that I hope you can see from this brief extemporization of my work that there are things going on that are consistent and that you find regularly at the more complex megalithic sites. Now, if archaeologists could come along and have a look at that, and, and they might find that, first of all, they'd be very welcome, but secondly, there's a massive amount of information being put together in the last 20 years by various people, including your good self, John Martineau, various other people that we all we all know, but we, we're ex muris we're outside the walls of the acad academic world because they don't want this stuff. And I have to ask you, why don't they want it? What is it about this uh, stuff that they don't want? Because if they keep ignoring it, what's going to happen is what's already started. Everything becomes a conspiracy theory, which means that, you know, oh, he doesn't believe that, you know, in ley lines, man, uh, means that it's a conspiracy by the culture we live in. And I don't believe that it's necessarily that. It might be fear, but I, it might also be, have to do with the fact that it might be rather embarrassing to find out that people 5,000 years ago were brainy and possibly more brainy than we are in many areas or had a higher understanding of the environment than we have. We're not look, doing very well, are we, in our understanding of the environment? Just at this particular moment in our history, we're not that special. And um, we're about to make extinct a whole load of species, including possibly ourselves, by just being stupid. But the megalithic people seem to live in some reasonable form of harmony. I mean, Mike Parker Pearson, again, is, has discovered and after work by Ewan Mackay and uh, uh, Lord, whatever he's called, Renfrew, in the 60s and 70s at Durrington Walls, that there was a massive party going on. It was like a Glastonbury winter solstice Glastonbury going on listening to the rhetoric on some of the other documentaries where people drove pigs all the length of the rent of Britain and you know feasted and no doubt got up to all sorts of other things that happened like what a Gavery has and and that shows a, a, a very large area of community activity going on. The units of length of the megalithic yard and the various feet that have been found are found throughout Northern Europe and, and Denmark and Ireland and, and no doubt other parts of the world. It's even been found in, in the, the Latin American countries, you know, the, the Hunab and, and, and the various other things related. So come aboard, give it a spin, you archaeologists, and stop making the documentaries that are perhaps a little bit tedious in their repetitive nature and the lack of information they give. I'm very much enthusiastically supporting the finding of the original an original stone circle that was moved. But we've had several locations in the last 10 years here. Mike has, has proposed Castechmauer, which is a huge henge, flat henge, much bigger than the henge at Stonehenge. It's 500 feet, roughly 500 feet across. And it's dead level, right in the middle of the Priscelli Mountains. Hard to get to because it's on private land. And from there, you get a wonderful view of the whole Priscelli range, coastal wise, and also on to the uh, south and, and, and west of, of, of where you're standing. Mike gives a, a, an audience to pe local people every year after his summer. And I think that 
you know, he's going to have to work hard from the people I know to persuade them that Wine Mound is a suitable is a suitable candidate for treatment. And he himself says that there could be another site that that would be more suitable. So I think that's fair, but he should come and find it. And maybe he should be based here rather than come here once a year for a long extended spell um, and drink beer at Brewstone Breweries, Brewstone Breweries, which is where the lecture's given every year now. Um, so what do you make of this, this theory that he's put forward that Wayne Mound is actually the origin point? I mean, is that being proposed before? And are the stones actually blue stones that are in that, in that supposed well, part of a what, circle? What, what, the important thing about Wine Mountain is it's a singleton. There's no, there's no stone circle visible near it. Um, the, round the corner, about a third of a mile away to, to the northeast of that site, uh, up a steep hill, there are, there's a two recumbent stones. They're big ones. And there's another one that looks remarkably like Wine Mound, but, but it's just like a small stone. I, I don't think that they're very good examples of bluestone, but I'm not a geologist um, and um, I'm not going to hack a bit off to do a sample. That's not, not part of my um, uh, qualification to do. I'm not going to desecrate a site. Wine Mound stands in a spring of water. It's unusual because the idea, the symbolism won't escape you, that a great, great big phallic megalith stuck in a spring is quite a symbol. There's another one on Colby Island, the same, um, which is just the same. But I, I think Wine Man is not high class bluestone. Um, but then the ones at Stonehenge aren't all high class bluestone. There's quite a lot of stuff that's a sort of rough imitation of bluestone or similar mineral. Um, and I'm not a geologist, so it's not my area. I have to rely on what they say. Also, one of your discoveries that I think, well, I'm certainly interested in, and it sort of blew my mind when you, I first heard you present it, was this lunation triangle, which connects geodetically the area of the Priscelli Bluestone Quarry with Lundy Island, which we also were involved in discovering something there, and Stonehenge. I mean, could you just talk a bit about that original discovery and why why isn't why aren't things like this mentioned, you know, in, in documentaries like this? Because to me, that's at the cutting edge, and this should be kind of brought out as there's a well, geodetic I mean, significance. Yeah, I, I entertained a film director who makes a lot of documentaries, quite well known ones, and it's particularly about pop stars that are getting on a bit. He does their life histories for Channel 4. He's done a number of those. Uh, um, and he came up here and was fascinated by um, the Protoss Stonehenge in Wales book, which is about another lunation triangle here in the Priscellis. The lunation triangle is an ancient symbol that has been completely forgotten or annihilated by ongoing cultural changes in some way. But basically, it enables you to calibrate the number of moons in the calendar year very accurately. Uh, just using simple geometry. It's a wonderful fluke of fluke of nature or coincidence. Some would say it had uh, metaphysical connotations, but if we just keep to what it does, if you take a 5, 12, 13 triangle and make it on the ground, uh, and you've done that with me, you automatically get the right angle when you bring the three lengths of rope together and peg them. Uh, and then you very quickly from that, you can derive the number of lunations in a year, the number of full moons in the exactly in the solar year. And, and it's all calibrated for you. So that then, if you make another rope of that number of moons marked off, there are about 12 and a third moons in a year. They're not 12. We have 12 months in the year, but they're not real months. And we, we used to have 13, and it's not quite 13 either. It's 12 and a third, roughly. But if you have a, a two lengths of rope, then along something like a cursus or a straight level piece of land, you can slide years of these ropes together. And that will enable you with one other little trick that the Blue Nation Tribe offers, which is strange that you should do. It offers you the chance to predict eclipses in advance. And I'm in no doubt that that was one of their star turns to be able to predict an eclipse. Gives you a certain amount of edge over your, the people that you are the priest of or that you are the wise person of, if you say at two o'clock tomorrow afternoon, the sun's going to be go black, um, 
or the moon is going to go copper coloured tonight. Be ready, guys. And it does. It sort of implies that you've got a direct line with the gods. And that brings me to another subject. Before we carry on with the lunation triangle, if we're going to be in touch with the gods, we've got to say as above, so below becomes a very important maxim. And many of these temples are an attempt to draw down the sky onto the earth. And I think that Stonehenge is, is acknowledged to be a temple to the sun and the moon. Um, you know, we've got quotes from Greek philosophers saying that just that Diodorus and as well uh, says, you know, every 19 years, the sun revisits the land. And we've got all sorts of things that link Stonehenge to the sun and the moon going on geometrically, metrologically and met metrologic metrologically. And but so astronomically, the, the sun and the moon are related at Stonehenge through the Station stone rectangle, which is a 12, 5 rectangle. So the sides are 5 and 12. The diagonal is 13, and that's the basis of the lunation triangle. So we find one in Stonehenge, and it's in units of eight megalithic yards. And, and, every, and this has been established by famous Stonehenge writers like Richard Atkinson and uh, Alexander Tom. So the surveys at Stonehenge show that to be true. And therefore, when you see the five sides pointing at the solar extremes, the midwinter and midsummer solstice, and the long signs pointing to the moon, maximum uh, setting and rising, then you can say that that's a lined site. And that it's saying something about five and 12 and consequently 13. If you take that a step further, and you find this other business, the lunation triangle, you then, if you're sitting down and thinking about it, and I did a lot of thinking when I lived in France, had no books, very good to go with no books for a while. Uh, you just sit down and you just think, and you work things out by drawing pictures and thinking. I looked at Stonehenge on the map, and I had this map of Southern Britain, and I had to travel through that territory in order to get back where I lived in Wales from this ferry, and I used to have a big motorbike then, and I used to hare back on the ferry because it was almost free and you just went as a foot passenger. So I used to go back and head through all that territory between Stonehenge and Wales. And on the map, you can see there's Stonehenge and there's the Bluestone site. And I measured the angle with a ruler from east and west and found it was the same as the lunation triangle, the 512-13. So you, you carry that line on from Stonehenge east-west and you end up in the middle of London, not just hitting Lundy, but actually right in the centre of Lundy. And where there is even a club that meets there called the Centre of the Island Club. And that's the right angle of the triangle. Now, if you carry north from there, from Lundy, you eventually come to the Priscellis. You don't, if it's going to be accurate in length, you don't go to the Bluestone site. It's a bit too far. But you go to a peak that had quartz on the top of it uh, called Carn Wen, that's rapidly being destroyed as I speak by people who want road road material. Um, but they've got to keep the profile right. But at the top there were huge pieces of quartz all over the place. The area is side of two football pitches and it's flat. And, and up till recently, if you went up there and you didn't make a lot of fuss, no one bothered you. But now it's patrolled because it's there's a huge cliff on one edge. And it's quite dangerous, really. Um, so that's that's the theoretical point. And it's, it's you from that point, you can it's the only place in the Priscellis where you can see through to the north of, of the Priscelli range. And just over here, only a mile and a half, you work the Bluestone site, which you can see very clearly. So it's it's a pretty good hit. It would be a miracle if it was exact, wouldn't it? Because they want they're all natural. Two of these things are natural features, Lundy and <laughs> the Bluestone site. But Stonehenge may have been placed where it is, it's a possibility, in order to create that 512.13. And I think my work has shown a very good case to put forward. Uh, I don't think that people should necessarily believe anything I write. They should read it and prove it for themselves. I'm a great believer in people using Google Earth and Maps in order to evaluate for themselves, whether I'm speaking with forked tongue or whether I'm working for the devil or has been said by some people or whether in fact I'm just a guy that wants to find out some answers, where before there were none. 
And that's the big problem, the dearth of stuff, to answer my original questions about megaliths, has not come from an archaeological book, although many of them have been very interesting. And I've had great help from archaeologists. Aubrey Burl, Ewan Mackay, both passed away this year. I shall miss them quite a lot. They were good. They were friendly. I mean, I had Ewan Mackay's been to stay with his wife here. And, and Aubrey Burl and I had, I've got hour long interviews with both of them done years ago, which I might sell to someone for the right fee. Um, be interested. Def definitely. Let's let's put it up on the let's put it up on the Megalithic Mania YouTube channel. People would love it. Um, Megalithic e Megalithic eBay, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, they're apps. I mean, Aubrey Bell. I, I didn't know you and Mackay had passed. I did not know that. Is that was that? He he spoke at Megalithic Mania a few years ago. He was absolutely brilliant. Yes, he did. I I persuaded him to go. Thank you. I, I said I said I said it would do you good, you and and, and uh, he was very. A very mild-mannered man, and um, not the brash northern that I can be, but it, he was a lot of fun. And we we went. He took me around um, sites in Scotland, um, like Kintraw, and um, and the uh, uh, the one in the, the valley, the valley where the lunar maximum stones are. The really good temple wood. And we spent an afternoon there. And it, he got because of his curator of the um museum um he got the opportunity to open up the exhibit i saw the 33 stones that they found at the equinoctial site at brain port bay um 33 being the number of the sun and um you know that was interesting they found a rotten leather bag underneath the stone where you take the measurements from and in it were 33 little pebbles and that was quite quite good and we spent a very nice day there um, so I've got no, no qualms that these people were my friends and we had good, good times together. Um, but I just, just think right now, after seeing this documentary, uh, it would be good if we could stop this silly uh, barrier thing and just start to do a bit of work together. And I, and I think, I mean, I'm up for it. I'm sure quite a lot of archaeologists I've talked to are up for it. But the, it's, for some reason, it's not happening. And we need to, I need to know what that reason is. And I will find out. I will Good. find out. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the things we obviously try and do at Megalithomania. We try and bring, yeah. bring these different elements yeah. together, these alternative, the yeah. academic, because there's so much we're all still learning. And I think that's, that's one of the things. But getting back to this documentary, there was a couple of things that caught my eye, which are, maybe you could comment on. One of them was the fact that they claim to have found one of the holes at Wan Mound was actually the same shape as one of the blue stones that's currently at Stonehenge. And they did this computer generated image of like yeah. slotting it in. Yeah. But I've got an issue with that because, you know, as you know, you've built stone circles. I've been involved in building modern stone circles. You, you don't just you don't just lift it up and put it straight in. You kind of have to move it about and try and fit it in. So the fact that do you think they're just trying to you know, is that just a coincidence or do you think there's something in that? Well, the answer, I can re in reverse order, the, the question you ask at the end, is that what they did? Uh, I don't think they're asking the right question at all there. I, you see, I, I think that what was, ans was answered was, did they move a circle uh, t to Stonehenge? Mike Parker Pearson says, yes, they did. And that's part of his evidence. This is a collection of cards, some of which are trump cards, some of which are duds which he has to filter through as what we get to hear. And he's had lots of duds, which is what happens with experimental research. You have years and years of not having anything happen much, and then suddenly you're onto something. But, what's, but what bugs me is no, that we don't know how they got to Stonehenge. And even more important, and no one seems to be asking that on the program, is why? Why move them? We got all this tribal stuff, and, and moving the, the gods and the important people, you know, and there was travel between the, the areas. But I mean, if they were doing pig droving from all areas of Britain every Christmas, it was not surprising that they had mates in Wales and they had mates everywhere else. And so that was an anomaly. We don't get to hear why. We don't, John Michel was very blunt about it. He said, the single question that everyone wants to know is not all this other stuff. It's what were they for, these monuments? whether it's a stone circle that might or might not have been at 
Stonehenge or Stonehenge itself. We have not answered that central question yet. Why were they built and what were they for? And that's what I want to do. And it's what I've set myself a task in, in trying to answer before I leave this mortal coil, shuffle it off and go somewhere else exciting. <laughs> hopefully not for a while. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully not for a while. Um, so an, oh, another thing... You're a good man, another, you're a good man. <laughs> another thing in this documentary as well, which kind of caught my attention was... Um, was the, the the other bluestone quarry, which has the rhyolite, which Craig Ross it fell in. Um, I, w- I went up to that a couple of years ago, and that's a, that's a different type of bluestone, it's, it's rhyolite yeah. type, and only yeah. one or maybe two stones at Stonehenge are made of that. But in the program, they didn't really say that. They said, this is one just one of the main bluestone sites. You're right, and a lot of local people are very confused by that. But on the other hand, uh, it's very, difficult for someone in the position Mike Parker Pearson's in um, to describe it in technical terms because again it would broach what makes a good program he's got to pitch it for the public and therefore the other stuff which nobody's going to read from the public the academic documents the papers and all that um, it's going to be make it very difficult for him I mean the fact is that the stone I've stood on that stone with Mike we've had a, we've had a good laugh there uh, together and um, uh, it, it's a very blue stone so it's a description of the colour of the stone but it has none of the uh, felspar pieces that blue stone has and it's not got that knobbly texture that you get with blue stones um, doesn't feel right either and, and you know but it, it, that quarry was obviously used they found a fire there a megalithic fire remains where they ate some disgusting stew or something made up of insects and worms and things and uh, shellfish <laughs> uh, and then they, they've got the other evidence of it they actually found where the the rocks were taken down but you can get that with real blue stones as you well know up at the bluestone site you've been up there um you know that you can see exactly how their mines work this was easy meat to get them away from they're all cracked with fissures along geometric like straight lines and you can pierce them lever them out you can even see the way the wedges of t- indeed on that program they showed where a wedge had been used to slide a, a big megalith down and there are some dead ones or dud ones or ones they didn't use fail the grade uh lying about down that mountainside that you know facing the not the south towards milford haven and uh, uh, and uh, uh, temby so we have to ask well what what is going on there with what why do people want to um move stones 135 miles as the crow flies or the pterodactyl flies why do they have to move those stones to stonehenge they, they, we're not talking three or four tons with those some of them are a bit more than that the program did underestimate some of the weights of the bigger blue stones um, but uh, most of them are yeah two to three tons but you know i wouldn't like to move them 135 miles we haven't got a definite route and we haven't got evidence of a sledge or how they were moved. We don't know whether they were rollers, greased rollers or we, we built a, on the documentary. They built a little box round one and pegged it. And, and that seems to me quite a sensible way of doing it because you can then get purchase on that, the wood round it and really give it a good pull. And um, but moving it 135 miles, there's got to be an immense and powerful reason to get people to do that. Especially when this sars this sarsen's just up the road, as we know, just at Marlborough Downs, at Fifield Down, just near Avebury. So they're only about seventeen or eighteen miles away. There's so, that what, there was know, that stone they said they found. Uh, was it Milford Haven? They said they found one or two blue stones there, and and that and that was one of the routes they put. They, I don't know yeah. if it was in this documentary, it was in a previous report, I think. Um, and yeah. then, but then other people say it was a water route they took. They were using the sea, then the rivers and the coast and other such things. But I mean, if you look at the Merlin, the Merlin myth, he used different versions, sort of different translations of Jeffrey's, Jeffrey of Monmouth's history of the yeah, yeah, yeah. He used uh, engines, gears, uh, sort of hinting that he had a technology or he just levitated the stones. Well, I mean, what, what these medieval people in their books were describing was a siege engine. 
which was all gears and exactly the same thing, but to throw a stone over a long distance, wasn't it? You know. Yeah, the thing with Merlin is he's a fourth, fifth century. Uh, if he had reality, he was born around the fifth century because he's the myths are all related to the time of Arthur, who is a, a sort of semi-mythical, maybe a number of kings that were powerful. The nation was in a bit of a mess around that time and they needed a hero figure and uh, Arthur's a solar hero, comes along and wins the day, except he gets killed at the end. But the, the thing is that the stones were described on the documentary, I think it was by um, the, the presenter, as being um, Alice. The, they were, it was presented as though Merlin said that the stones came from Ireland and everyone immediately then looks to Ireland for the source of the stone, or in some cases from Africa. But the point that wasn't made is, and little known even by Welsh people, is that in the fifth century, uh, this area, the, the, the Bluestone area, and most of South West Wales was ruled by the Irish. But, but I mean, I'm not writing anything revolutionary there, it's well known. And the Romans, when they cleared off and scarpered back to France, thinking that England was about to be invaded by barbarians, left an Irish uh, tribe in, in, in control of the area. And they got on reasonably well with the well, local Welsh people because they spoke the same language. And the outcome of it is that Merlin, being born at that time, would think, because Irish was spoken as the main, main language, would think that Ireland was West Wales. It was a colony of, of Ireland, in fact. But it, it, you can quite see that where the confusion could... I mean, medi medieval stuff is so muddy, isn't it? It can so easily become this or that or that. But the fact is, if you believe in Merlin as a, a real person born around the time that they say he was born, which is about sometime in the 5th century AD, um, then he would have been born in a, in a world where he would have been told it was Ireland. It would, he would have been part of Ireland. And trips across the sea were made with free freedom. The monks were able to travel wherever they wanted. And it was on a main trading route. So, you know, from Ireland. So uh, that's just one aspect of it. And I thought Merlin was presented on the programme as though he was some sort of Neolithic person or much earlier than, than post-Christian. A lot of historians must... But Welsh historians would have been cringing and they're grinding their teeth at that point. Um, but I don't want to criticise the programme for bringing it up because it's part of Stonehenge's history. And it's as interesting as the monument itself, the varied history and the number of people have added to it over the years. But it, if you wanted to know what to do with Stonehenge, I certainly wouldn't wrap it up in cellophane and, and make sure no one sees it, which is, seems to be much more what's going on now with monuments. They, they need to be properly secure, but uh, people need to be in them to experience what they do. They affect people. And that's an as another aspect, nothing to do with my regular work, but very much part of my uh, experience at sites. But I have had about 84 emails in the last few days, some from academics, most of them from people who either I know who have been on tours or have listened to read books of mine uh, and other people and want to let me know how it felt like they've been to a funeral. But for all the work that's been done on the other aspects of these monuments, we're still stuck with whether this stone went to Stonehenge, which is something that goes back decades, this idea of stones being moved. It's a century, very nearly, since the first guy measured the blue stones, the petrography of, of the stones at the, in the bluestone quarry and found that they matched stones at at Stonehenge. Hubert Thomas in 1923 gave a paper to the Geographical Society. I think he might even have been president for a while. And, and the paper was well received. And from that moment on, everybody has had this in their head that the Blue Stones came from Wales. It's been challenged. How they got there has been challenged. It's either Ice Age movement and or it's, um, you know, it, it, it couldn't possibly be human or, or it's you sweat and toil. And, and that's hard to explain too. So the answer to your question is that that unless you've done, gone through the route of understanding that stuff, you're not prepared to um, understand properly the nature of a documentary like we, we saw. I think the, there was a lot of background that could have been put in there. And 
I can show you in the Priscellis and connected with all the sites that everybody goes to see, another lunation triangle that's so accurate, it's unbelievably accurate. And it's, it's there across miles of territory and three high points that are well known, one marked with a very well known monument, to one marked with a monument that's been ne nearly destroyed by a farmer trying to get rid of rabbits in the 1950s, and, and Carningley, which is the sacred mountain of the area. And it's a 5, 12, 13, and it's in units that are to do with the time periods of the sun and moon. And in, in megalithic yards, I can't arrest my case. And do you want to hear another one? Do you want to hear another good one? Sure. Another good one is Stonehenge. Right, we all know that it's for years. This is another weakness. This is I'm answering your question, you. I'm not wandering here. But you asked me, and other people have made the comment, that what's happened to Lionel Sims' theory of the midwinter sunset being the most important? Suddenly we're back on summer solstice is back. You know, all this about winter feasting and the fact that they went up the avenue in order to see the midwinter sunset which he doesn't quite accurately fit if you do the, if I, if I use my program, available at all good bookshops, if you use that program and then type it up and use it, you'll find that the, it's not quite right, the midwinter one. It's not quite opposite, the midsummer one. But if you take the avenue, which has always been assumed to be the direction of the midsummer sunset at the time, um, and you measure the length of it, which I did with the, while I was staying in your place in Stonehenge Cottages early in the morning, then you discover the length of that avenue in megalithic fathoms, which is two megalithic yards length, is exactly 1988 um, feet long in their feet. But I made a pedometer, which you know what a pedometer is? Thing you roll. You see our the measuring roads with them. It's a wheel. I made a pedometer with a megalithic fathom as the circumference. It makes it really easy, very quickly, to make an assessment of a length. It's quite accurate. It's accurate to within 1%, if you're careful. And you measure that. It's 1,988 feet. It means nothing. Chris Chippendale's book on Stonehenge, The Complete Stonehenge, tells you that it's just under 2,000 feet. And then it veers off to the right, down to the Avon, and that's what the subject of many documentaries previously about Durrington walls and, and that. You get to the point where you have to grab the bull by the horns and divide 1988 by 5.444, which is the megalithic furlong in feet. And when you do that, it's 365.25. Ha ha! That's the year. The thing that marks the year at Stonehenge is the annual solstice thing. And there's the avenue, which is 365 and a quarter megalithic furlongs in length. Now, that's a pretty important bit of information. So, so you're thinking there, you, I can hear the cogs. So why isn't, why isn't that public knowledge? Why, doesn't that, why isn't that taken on board? Because it is actually quite an important measurement, that one, isn't it? In the right units, the same units as we get in the station stone rectangle at Stonehenge, which everybody accepts. If you convert that to megalithic fathoms, you're going to find out that that's nice whole numbers and it's significant too. But we won't go there. We'll just say, look, the avenue, it marks the year uh, where the sun rises in at 4.52 in the morning. Awful time to be up, um, it, but worth it. Magnificent sunrise occurs occasionally there and it's on the line. And that the length of that is 365.2 something feet uh, megalithic furlongs uh, and what else can that mean it means that they were measuring the year and that was the units they were doing a day for a, a day is a megalithic furlong a representation but it's a length of time not just a length it's a length of time represented and then you can make ropes and then you can do astronomy because you note mark events on the rope, like a keep rope in, in Latin America that the Peruvians used to mark um, key events. You know, the, the ropes with splices in, marking events in time, lengths of time. And we can, you can do all sorts of things because you've then got a, a way of recording time and doing sums by putting ropes of different times together and see how often you get an eclipse and 
what the repeat cycles are. There's all sorts of things you can do. That's the stage of my work where I would like to spend more time in the future, is actually building a few engines that, or machines that, with ropes or mechanisms that show how to do that process easily. Um, and one final thing at Stonehenge that wasn't covered was that they showed Woodhenge. And somehow Woodhenge is mysteriously linked to a lunar energy and Stonehenge to a solar energy. It wasn't explained. Um, now, the thing is that no one seems to have done at Stonehenge. It, it, Woodhenge was discovered in 1927 by 24 took a photograph from the air. Uh, a pilot took a very early aerial photograph showing that it was more than just a mound. And then the Cunninghams, Maud Cunninghams and her husband, ex excavated it just before finished about 1929 and wrote it all up and discovered it was concentric, a concentric sort of ellipse shape um, with several different layers of posts coming concentrically outwards. Now, that's not what concerns me here. The middle of it, of the monument, and connected to the middle of Stonehenge, is at the same angle from east-west as the lunation triangle for a 512-13. Make a 512-13 with lune N, lune, you have no right angle that I can find on the ground. It would have to go underground. We'd have to go into Mike Parker Pearson's domain of being only evidence underground. That needs to be looked at. That right angle, I can define that point exactly. No one's asked me for it, but you can do, you, you know, it'd be nice to be asked sometimes. And I would say it's there, those coordinates, go there, dig, lo, lo, load our, Get your wheelbarrows and your towed tractors and get all your beeps and your electronic signals and just see what's under that point. But the point is, it is a 512-13 triangle. And it's in units of, uh, well, it's in units that are multiples of the Aubrey circle diameter at Stonehenge. Now, if that's the case, you can't say that Woodhenge is somehow not to do with Stonehenge. It's his sister it's like Cinderella, it's been ignored. It's a load of concrete dustbin lid moulds that are emptied in the field. It's a hideous mess because it's been done by the Ministry of Works, which wasn't the most artistic group of people around in the 1930s. But it is a remarkable coincidence that it's a 512-13 triangle that's using units of length that make sense astronomically. And maybe the people who are listening to this might like to go and verify that. I've got that on my website, there's details of that. Um, and I'm doing this off the cuff. I've not got a script or anything to read. So I, but I, that is the, I think Woodhenge is a great, a great revelation to me because it's been there doing nothing, going nowhere uh, for years. Nobody really had a place for it. It's a singularly uninteresting place to visit apart from these concrete plugs that they put in the ground to mark where the post holes were i'd well, like to rebuild it couldn't yeah. look worse it could be rebuilt yeah you could do that some great great beautiful wooden posts they could like build it like it was and... loads, loads of people loads of people around here are living in houses like that and they'd love to get the chance to do that i mean we're talking top craftsmen there's loads of people building up they're living in around here that are made much the same way Okay, so I think we're coming, you know, we're getting near the end of this, but I just want to, is it, I mean, is it anything, I mean, this whole documentary, it's obviously going to be viewed all around the world, people are going to be talking about it. Is there, I mean, is there any final thing that you believe could have been added to it, just to kind of give it the kind of, the full story? It's very, very powerfully tells us where Mike Parker Pearson has taken this work, and all credit to him. He's, I mean, this guy works very hard. And I've no doubt I've seen him in action on sites. I've stood there and watched and taken photographs. And he, he's all over the place. And I mean, you know, it's 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 a very useful piece of information. But, you know, sometimes you've got to include people with other bits of information. And not it, this is not a heroic journey we're on. This is the journey of persistence and a careful observation measurement. It's just like any other subject. You can't jump to conclusions. Now, I don't suggest he has. He's taken a long time. So 10 out of 10 for that. I, I think that the idea of uh, not including enough background information is probably a product of the editor's flaw rather than the people who took part. I think that the decision was taken to remove number 
remove complication. I've been told again and again, your stuff's got too much numbers in it. Well, I put to these people, how are you ever going to understand a culture that I can see work totally using number and form and geometry all the time? It seems to be that that was one of their major things that they were doing. And if you take monuments on the landscape and how they're connected one to another, no one's looked at that. And once you look at that, you see that this, if you can't put number down in a documentary, if it's taboo, you're never going to understand the culture. And I think that's a good place to end. Do we want to understand this culture and get real? Or do we want to continue to dig up the graveyard? And all we're going to find is death, weapons, and, and, and we'll find interesting things, sure. But there's so much on the top that anybody can do. You don't need an archaeological degree to measure the distance apart of any of these places. And it's really good with Google Earth. You can get really accurate. And you can do it on a... On a I mean, I've got a big... I'll show you. But a special treat tonight. I've got a big old-fashioned drawing board over there with a map on it. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's what I use all the time. And, and a pair of dividers and measure. So there you are. It's what I do. And I can't say that anything that anyone else does is particularly unfavourable. I'm glad to see people working on Stonehenge. But I think... If I was doing the narrative for that documentary, it would be significantly different. And that's just, a, then therefore it's personal, isn't it? So bravo for doing it. Could could do better, maybe. All right, well, thanks. Thanks for your time, Robin. I appreciate it. I mean, if no, people want to... If people want to catch up with Robin, they can go to robinheath.info. The relevant books that kind of cover some of the stuff we've been talking about are Temple in the Hills and Proto Stonehenge in Wales, which came out some time ago before this documentary, obviously. And so, but and Robin just gives a much more detailed and a different perspective. And because you live there, obviously, you, you, you get a chance to actually study the landscape to a very high level. So, yeah, thanks again, Why Robin. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. I hope I hope I've provided you with enough information. That's, that's fantastic. Thanks so much, Robin, and uh, I'll catch up with you soon.